you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ruth, the book of Ruth, as we continue on our series on attachment. Ruth chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Ruth chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz who was from the clan of Elimelech. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this space of vulnerability, for us to peel back more layers and to discover how we can become more healthily attached to you and to one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen and amen. So last week we explored the insecure attachment style of avoidance. Avoidance are the ones that desire to be connected, they desire to be attached, but they learned early on in their childhood that being too vulnerable and experiencing all these big feelings and not having them met made them feel they needed to withdraw. Anytime they shared too many tears, anytime they expressed too much emotion, maybe a parent shut them down and says, act like a big boy, act like a big girl. And so they try to find this balancing act of not being too close as to be pushed away, but just close enough to be accepted. And they bring that attachment style into their adult relationships. And what it can look like is somebody who's not interested somebody who doesn't desire to be connected, someone who doesn't really love the person they're with. And that can be really, really stressful in certain relationships. Well, today we're gonna go a little bit deeper. We're gonna talk about another insecure attachment style, but one that many of you may find more relatable. And this is anxious attachment. Last week, we learned of this story for some of you, maybe for the first time, some of you, it was a, it was a, a, a retelling of sorts of Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. Ruth uh, married the son of Naomi, and her sister also married one of the sons, well, sister-in-law married one of the sons. And Naomi experienced such tragedy when she was living among the Moabites. She lost her husband during this time of famine. She lost both of her sons to death. And on her return back to Bethlehem, when she heard the famine had ended in Bethlehem, the two daughter-in-laws desire to be with her. They cling to her. They don't want her to leave without her. And she's okay with it up to a certain point and says, no, what? It doesn't, it's not pragmatic. Baby girls, go back to your homeland. Go back to your parents. Find another husband. I won't be hurt. You can't stay with me. I can't provide you any more children. And even if I were to have kids today, you wouldn't wait long enough to be able to marry them. And Orpah, she decides to leave. We talked about that, that, that particular interaction where she seemed to be so close and connected to Naomi, only with a little bit of convincing, was willing to go back. In fact, in Jewish traditions, many believed that this was almost an act of rebellion. They saw Orpah as the, almost an enemy of God because she wasn't willing to cling to Naomi. In fact, in some Jewish traditions, they believed that Orpah was the mother of Goliath. Can you believe that? That Orpah ended up being the mother of Goliath. And those of you who know your history know that Ruth's descendant is David, the one who best Goliath. And so many Jewish theologians and, and uh, scholars of the day saw them as polar opposites, what to do and what not to do. And what Ruth does is she will not be urged away. She clings to Naomi and says, my God 
will be your God. Your God will be my God, and, and your people will be my people, and your land will be my land, and I want to be with you. I want, I want to stay connected with you for the rest of my life, and may not even death separate us. We talked about this level of intimacy, this level of connection. And it's not romantic, although some have tried to see it in that way, but it's not a romantic connection. It's an authentic bond that they experienced, and Naomi gives into it. And so here we are in chapter 2. We're in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, I imagine that Naomi is still depressed. She's still just sitting on the couch watching The Price is Right. Unable to leave the home. Remember at the end of chapter 1, she says, my name is no longer Naomi, it is bitterness. I am Mara, I am bitter. And so it's, it's Ruth at the beginning of chapter 2 who says, mama, I'm just going to go out and see if I can find some work. And Naomi completely, seemingly disconnected, says, all right, girl, you go, you go on. Now, Naomi is still young enough to go work herself. She still has the ability to do something outside of the house. But for whatever reason, she's paralyzed. And I want to say something to you. Even though most of our attachment to styles are developed as children, we can develop new attachment styles. Some that are positive and secure, but we can also develop different negative attachment styles. I, I confessed that I was an avoidant growing up. I learned that being too vulnerable meant that I would not get enough attention. So I learned to be hyper-independent so that my parents would recognize me and praise me for being a good boy and an independent kid and can problem solve on my own. And I took that into my adolescence and even a bit into my adulthood. But let me tell you something. Trauma has a way of forcing us to find new coping mechanisms. Some of you may have grown up with a very secure attachment style, but then you experienced a divorce or you experienced the death of a child. And before you know it, your, your world has been unraveled and you cannot, see, you cannot see the light anymore. You can't, like Naomi, get off the couch. I believe that Naomi had a secure attachment style. I believe that she was a healthy person. And the reason why I believe that is because of how attached Orpah and Ruth were to, towards her, to her. They, they, they were so connected, they were willing to leave what was familiar to them and follow after her into the unfamiliar because their connection with Naomi was that strong. Let me tell you something. If you're not a person that, that, that has a healthy attachment, your kids pick up on it. They know. They know. They'll know that you can't be trusted. They'll know you're not the person they can run to. They will know you're not the person they can depend on. The fact that these two young women could depend on Naomi during the most tragic times of their lives says something about who Naomi is. And that should be applauded. Naomi is a solid person, except when tragedy hits us, and hits us significantly, and hits us repeatedly, we all have a point where we break, and Naomi clearly breaks. You try losing your husband and your only two children in the span of 10 years, and tell me how God-fearing you end up being. Tell me how strong your relationship is with God. All of us have a breaking point, and I mentioned this last week, even John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of a woman, had a breaking point where he had to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the one or should we be looking for another? Even Jesus has moments where he breaks on the cross. Father, Daddy, why have you left me? We all have our breaking points. And no matter how much, no matter how much I survived by being an avoidant, I went through something in my adult life that broke me to the point where I became a severe, anxious, attached person. Now, those of you who are wondering what does anxious attachment look like, I'm going to describe a couple of things, and you may be able to connect with this. Anxious, attached style characteristics. People who are anxiously attached are often intensely jealous. Who are you talking to? He's one of your friends? You sure about that? How long have you known him? 
intensely jealous. Jealous of who you're talking to, who you may like, who you think is pretty. You do not say stuff like that. Oh, boy, that actress is one of, oh, she's attractive. Oh, she is. They're jealous of hypothetical stuff. If I were to die, would you get married again? If you're married with the anxiously attached person, the answer is no. I would never. It wouldn't even cross my mind. Right? Anxious, anxiously attached people need an abnormal amount of connection to reassure them. They're the ones that will text you, and if you do not respond within seconds, if you do not respond within the appropriate amount of time, they are assuming you're angry, you're upset. You don't like them anymore. You've lost interest. I, re I remember this one person uh, texted me, and uh, uh, oh, well, actually, I texted them. It was like middle of the day, and they said, this is the first time you thought of me? No. Well, then why didn't you text me when you thought of me? I was doing stuff. <laughs> Am I not important? I've been thinking about you. I said, well, why didn't you text me? Because I was waiting for your text. Anxiously attached people also need constant affirmation. They need to know, they need to know where they stand with you. They'll need to know how attractive they are in your eyes. They'll need to know that they're the funniest person. They'll need to know, they'll need to know. It's important, the reason why people who are anxiously attached have this style is because they dealt with some level of abandonment in their childhood, or maybe they dealt with it even in their adult life. Someone who promised to be there, then for whatever reasons, they broke their heart. I remember, I remember as a kid, I remember being one of those hopeless romantics, one of those hopeless romantics. I was, I, I loved romance. I don't even know why I did. I was, again, I was like 13, 14, 15 years old, and I'm like, oh, Little Mermaid, just kiss Eric. I used to watch that movie over and over again, and I, 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 I would just think, they're so close this time. They're so close, it's going to happen. A hopeless romantic. Remember being in sixth grade and all oh, my big crush, Johanny. Yeah, try saying that name. But oh, I, 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 was, I just had the biggest crush on her, and I would write her little notes. And let me tell you something. Back then, we would use songs to start off our poems. Now, they, you can't use any of the modern-day songs to start off any poem today. But back then, this is the 80s, you still could. And I would start it off with my favorite artist, Prince, one of his, my favorite songs from him called Adore, and I would start it off and I would say, until the end of time, I'll be there for you. You are my heart and mind. I truly adore you. I, I mean, I was there until the end. It wouldn't even be until sixth grade, until the end of time. But that was different. I was young and immature. But when I got into seventh grade, my first girlfriend, I thought I was going to marry. And you could tell me otherwise. I put her picture up there on my bedside table. One day, dear. But I grew up, 10th grade, I was really serious then. I knew for sure it was going to work out. Another broken heart. Then college, by this time you're on your own, you're independent, watch me now. Pacific Union College, my second day of school, I met the one. Another broken heart. So many broken hearts, you begin to see attachment as something that's not permanent. 
You become afraid that you will be abandoned, that someone will leave you and let go of you. And then I begin to develop another type of attachment style. And people that have both avoidant and anxious are called a little bit different. They're called disorganized. <laughs> Literally, that is the scientific term, disorganized attachment. We can vacillate back and forth. What does it mean? Let's talk about it. Let's, let's put everything on the table. Let's, let's make sure we understand that we're on the same page here. Oh, was I a communicator? I wanted to know it all. And when you're an avoidant in a marriage, and when you're anxious in a marriage, you can create tension. And depending on who your partner is and what their attachment style is, you can be triggering each other all over the place. Marriage should be a place where there's safety, right? But how can you feel safe when you don't know what's going on inside of you and your partner doesn't know what's going on inside of them and you're both triggering one another and what you need to soothe your triggers, they need the opposite of and vice versa and all of that kind of stuff. And back in the day, we didn't have the terms that we have today. Most of us didn't know. We never heard of anxious attachment, right? We would simply call it, I'm romantic and you're not. The reason I send you a hundred texts every single day is because I'm in love with you. Only now are we able to understand some of our behaviors, and this is the reason why we must put light on it, because if we do not know why we are doing what we're doing or why we are who we are, we will continue in certain patterns that will be destructive. And it doesn't mean you don't love the person. It doesn't mean you don't like the person. It just means you are unaware of how you come off. Anxious folk, let me tell you something. Your jealousy, your need to be constantly affirmed can actually create an environment that will actually make your worst fear come true. You don't want to be abandoned, and you will create an environment where someone will want to leave you. Again, it's not the way that God designed us to be, but it is a reaction to the sinful and broken planet that we are in. Ruth is on the couch. She has hit a certain point in her life. She does not want to leave the house. And Ruth says, Mom, I'm going to leave. Now, I want you to know something. Ruth leaving the house as a foreigner and going out into fields trying to find work was dangerous. Are you hearing me? Dangerous. Naomi wasn't going out with her and saying, honey, let's, let's see if we can meet some nice neighbors. Oh, that's the Parkers. Oh, they're sweet, baby. You can work in their field. Naomi wasn't doing any of this. She says, all right, baby, just I'll see you later, hopefully. Mama, Naomi, what's going on with you? Protect your daughter. Be there for your daughter. When we have not had certain needs met, when we begin to see relationships as something that will harm us in the end, it creates a type of attachment that can be disassociated. It can be disconnected. It can be, it can be aloof. It can be resistant. It can be avoidant. And the things that you love and you crave, you will actually push away. I'm probably certain Naomi at this point doesn't want to be close again because everyone she was close to before died. All right, baby, all right, be good. Chapter 2, verse 5 through 7, it says, Boaz asked the over, I'm sorry, we actually went to, yeah, here we go. Uh, in verse 5, it says, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She came into a field and has remained here from morning till now except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz comes, checks on his field, and he sees a, a new thing working out in the field. He goes, who's that? And by this time, everybody seems to know her story. Oh, that's the Moabite. She came back with Naomi. She's, yeah. The Bible continues on. Boaz says in verse 8, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women 
who work for me, watch the field there where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men what? Not to lay a hand on you, which meant this was a possibility. This is why this was dangerous. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Ooh, Boaz is taking care of Ruth now. He hears of her story, knows her profile, has looked at a couple of her photos on Instagram. He's like, she cool. Verse 10, it says, at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about you. I have been told all about you and what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and, have, and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I'm just going to park it here for a little bit. I love this part of the story because Ruth, up to this point, has done nothing that has been self-serving. It would have made sense for her to go back with her sister-in-law to the Moabites and find another husband. It would have made sense that she would have stayed within familiarity. It would have made sense for her not to be a foreigner in a strange land. It would have made sense for her not to count her mother-in-law as her real mama. All of that would have made sense. But the beauty of it is, is that when she is securely attached, and when we are securely attached, we do things from a different place. See, securely attached people aren't afraid of dysfunction in other people's lives. When you are securely attached, you can understand and empathize with people who are hurting because their hurt and their pain is not a reflection of you, it's a reflection of what they're feeling and what they've gone through. But that is so difficult when we're in relationships because when a person is jealous and they go off on us and they need constant attention, we just don't feel trusted. So we want to react from a place of defensiveness. You don't trust me? You think I'm going to do something crazy? Instead of realizing where our partner is coming from and saying, oh, 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 honey, come here, come here. Can I hold you? Can I hold you right now? You're not feeling this secure? Oh, there ain't nothing wrong with me. You just need to show up on time. I know. Come here. Can I just hold you? <gasps> when are you going to be a man of your word? If you say 8 o'clock, it needs to be 8 o'clock, not 8.15. I know. I know. Come here. Come here. You see, when your partner's talking about you not being on time, often really what they're trying to tell you is that, I miss you. But you didn't hear it as such, right? Because you're ready to fight. What? What? Well, you know, there were certain things I just had to do, and if I hadn't have done it, we wouldn't have food on the table. How about that? Somebody has to work around here. But watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. The sure sign, the sure sign that you are healthily connected to your partner is that you can feel their pain. If you were to take a needle and prick my hand and I didn't feel anything, the doctors in the house would say, ooh, something's wrong. How did you not feel that needle prick? I'm just strong. No, you should be able to feel this. No, I'm just impenetrable. I'm Superman. Nothing hurts me. No emotional reaction. No, no, no. You should actually feel this prick. When you cannot feel pain in the members of your body, that is a sure sign that something is wrong with the members of your body. Something is wrong with the synapses in your brain. There is, there is a disconnection of sorts. If you can't feel a part of your body, some doctors will start talking about paralysis. Maybe we need to amputate, depending on what the situation is. 
when we can feel the pain of our partner, it spells to them and everyone watching that we are connected to our partner. When she hurts, I hurt. When he hurts, I hurt. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says that when one part of the body suffers, all the body suffers, right? When just one part suffers, all of the body suffers. You know how that is. I'll never forget this. It was like it happened yesterday. I was playing basketball. Somebody's driving to the hole and I'm going to block their way to the basket so I step in front of this person. And they swing their arms to try to get through me, to squeeze by me, and his elbow hits me right in the eye. I got hit so hard, I looked at the ground and said, just fall down, please. Just fall down right now. But of course, I had to be strong. So the guy asked me, are you okay? Are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. I see stars. And I did not want to show weakness. I didn't even leave the game. It was like, ball up. I can barely see. A couple guys came to me and said, oh, man, you need to put ice on that right now. No, I'm good. I'm good. Eyes all swelling shut. I'm good. For the next two weeks, this happened about two weeks ago, for the next two weeks, I was acutely aware I had a nose. I was finally aware of everything around my eye. Why was I aware? Because I could feel what? Everything. Everything. Didn't want to hug anybody. No, it might be too close. Some of you, last Sabbath, you came in tight. I was like, oh, that didn't feel right. You become aware. And this is where we should be. When we are deeply connected, when we're deeply connected, we can feel each other's pain. We can feel each other's heart's ache. And this is why it's so important to be healthily attached. When the body is healthily connected, it feels what's going on. Everything in me was aware of the painful part on my face. And I like this part of the story because because Ruth basically says to Naomi, Mom, I know you're not feeling well. I know know you're having a more difficult time getting through this part of of life. I'll go work. I'll put myself in harm's way. I'll go out there and earn enough for us to be able to live. So she puts herself out there. And when she puts herself out there, guess who is protecting her? Who's protecting her? Don't say Boaz. He eventually protects her, but God is protecting her every step of the way. God is the one that leads her to the right field. She didn't just come up on that on her own. She wasn't searching through Facebook and said, ooh, that's a connection. There's a family, they're family friends. Okay, good. She shows up at a field thinking it's just by chance. But let me tell you something. When God is walking with you, When God is walking with you, when you choose for him to be your God, you will find yourself at the right place at the right time. And watch this, watch this. Even when we have missteps where we put ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, if God is walking with you, Ruth has a new God now, and he's the one that is guiding her. And so she's finding herself in the perfect place, and, and she's gleaning. And, and the men are like, no, 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 she a cutie, but we can't touch her. She's gleaning. And then, you know, and then, you know she's saying, how, how could you find so much favor? What did I do? Oh, girl, we've heard everything about you. We all know your story. Can I tell you something right now? Your character, your good deeds, how you treat one another, it will always be equity. You will always be able to pull from that. That's why I don't think for a second that any of the things that you do that are positive, that are uplifting, that are encouraging, that are, that are thoughtful, that are loving, that are compassionate. Let me tell you something. We reap what we have sown, and it is literally happening in Ruth's life right now. She is reaping what she has sown. Now, she doesn't understand it. She's like, I haven't done anything. How could you be so nice? Because here's the best part. People who are healthily attached, people who are spiritually healthy, people who have a connection with God are unaware of all the good they do. They don't keep score. 
anxious, attached people, ooh-wee, they'll keep a score. Well, last night, <laughs> don't they? And I've been there before. I, I would think, I said, listen, yo, you, you, you want to, you want to you wanna, you wanna have this kind of disagreement? Okay, okay, okay. Well, let me tell you, on Tuesday, on the 3rd of March, this is what I did. In fact, I'll show you a screenshot. <laughs> like in some kind of courtroom. And let me tell you something. If you're trying to assuage or soothe somebody's anxiousness, let me tell you, do not use facts. As if anxiously attached people are going to go, oh, you're right. Yeah, my bad. Anxiously attached people aren't looking for facts. They're not trying to be logical. Everything in them is screaming inside saying, you're not safe. You're going to leave me. And here you are trying to use facts. There's a very famous story, very infamous story in my life where I tried to soothe someone. They said, hey, I don't feel like we're spending enough time with each other. I said, well, let me pull out my Bank of America statement. <laughs> and I went through it. Went on a date here, went out to eat here, went to the movies here, went to the museum here. What do you mean we're not spending enough time? I was arguing it very logically, right? And what you do, watch this, you logical folk out there, you, you avoidance out there. What I was basically saying is that you're crazy. I don't know how you could think that way. How could you see it that way? Here's the truth. I, I'm this and I'm that and I've been good and I've done this and I've had your back here. I've done all this stuff. And then, and then you want to shut them down, shut down the argument. And you're defensive for your own reasons, right? Because you're also afraid. And you don't want that person to leave you. So you want to show them how good you really are. So you're going to defend it with your Bank of America card statement. When there's something deeper there, right? Sometimes people don't have the words for it. And they can't say stuff like, at the time, they can't say stuff like, no, it's not that we're not going out. I just don't feel connected to your heart. I don't feel you see me. Yeah, we went to Disneyland, but I never felt connected. When we can be safe with one another and say, listen, everything we talk about is not about accusing one another. It's just about being heard and knowing where, what you feel and where you are right now. Ask away. Well, I feel like you never respect me. Well, no, that, that's not a feeling. That's not a feeling. That's not a feeling. You're, you're, you're accusing me of something. Tell me how you feel. <sighs> I feel scared. Why? I'm afraid you're going to find someone better than me. Why? I know I'm not good enough. Ooh. Now we're getting somewhere. You see what happens? Honey, I... I know there's things that come up, and I know there's a reason why you got here at 8.15. But can I just tell you what happens to the little girl inside of me? I remember how many times my father didn't come back home for dinner. So when you're not here at 8 o'clock when you say you were going to be here, that little girl starts to cry. And because I don't want to be vulnerable and cry, I just want to be angry. I'm going to come at you. I know you're not a bad guy. I'm just a scared girl at times. Oh, come here, come here, baby, come here. Let me hold you. Let me hold you. Right? Ruth isn't doing anything from a place of wanting to be selfish. She's not trying to secure a certain position. Everything she does comes from a place of deep attachment. She goes with, she goes with Naomi, not because Naomi's old and she needs help. She goes with Naomi because she's connected. It would be like cutting off her own arm. 
Oh, I can't. No, 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 mom, 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 no. I'm not your real mama, though. You had, no, no, but you don't understand. I never bonded with her the way I've bonded with you. You're the one I want to spend the rest of my life with. Your God is my God. Your people are my people. Your land is my land. Your home is my home. And may death not even separate us. So when Boaz is looking at her and saying, you've done all these great things, your compassion, you're all these things you've done, and she's like, I'm just living life with my mom. I don't... I don't get it. Why would you, why would I, why are people talking about, I just, I just love my mama. I just, I'm, I don't, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you in prison? When did we do these things? What are you talking about? You see what security looks like? Let's wrap up on this. She says, verse 13, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. She said, you have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. You hear the way that Ruth sees herself? I'm not even on the level of your servants. I don't even get it. Verse 19 and 20, she comes back home after a whole day. I know Naomi was probably relieved her daughter came back through the door. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. Naomi said, oh, the Lord bless him. The Lord bless him. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Who's she talking about now? Who's she talking about now? He has not not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. Who's she speaking to? Who's she speaking of? She's speaking of God now. Oh, the Lord bless him. The Lord bless Boaz. And then she switches subjects. Oh, God has not stopped showing kindness to me. Remember in chapter 1, I am Mara. I am bitter. Oh, the Lord has forsaken me. I am a, I'm nothing. Oh, now Naomi's back in the game. Oh, God has been so good. He has shown kindness to those who are living and to the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Baby, you hit the jackpot. That's kinfolk. That's fam. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. Next week we'll talk about what that means. But this is such A beautiful closing to chapter 2 because Naomi is now convinced even in all of the famine in her life with everything being taken away. And this is for you out there, you anxious folk. This is for you out there. One of the things that has us terrified, one of the things that keeps us up at night is we feel like everything's going to get worse. Everything is going to be bad. Everything is going to fail. Everything around us, so we're trying to control things and make sure it doesn't happen. And God is trying to tell us this one thing today, and he wants to assure you, I will provide. I will provide. I am your provider. You continue to follow in the footsteps of my son, Jesus Christ, and I will provide. There will be provision everywhere for you. Some of my worst nightmares came to pass, but I can tell you today, God provides. Some of my worst fears have been realized, and I'm here to tell you today, God provides. I have walked into fields where I am hungry and naked and with no hope, with shame covered all around me. And God just starts dropping blessings like Boaz told his workers, hey, when you're picking this crop and you're picking this vegetable, just drop it behind you. I want her to pick it up. I don't want her just to get the scraps. You give her some of the good stuff. When you pick that apple, just drop it. This is what God starts doing, even in fields that are not our fields. God just starts, just stops, starts dropping things and blessing us. I'm telling you here today, I am a byproduct of God's provision.
I shouldn't be here, but I am. If you knew my story, if you knew the ins and outs, you would shake your head and say, how? And I can tell you now, God provides. And I want to remain attached to his side. Wherever he goes, he's going to be my God. Because no matter if we're on Mount Calvary or the Mount of Olives, I want to be near his side. God provides. And my life may not look like the way I hoped it would, but I have never experienced more joy and more peace than I do now. Learning to attach in a healthy way, not allow, allowing fear to be our guide and to, and, 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 and to be slaves to our fear, but just moving in peace and hope and assurance that God will provide gives me a good night's sleep. You want to be there, family? If that's where you are today, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. This may be your desire to fully, to fully commit yourselves to a God who provides, to fully give in to his assurance. I know what your default mode is. I know it's an anxious attachment. I know it's an avoidant attachment. But God is saying you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. That was our scripture. That was our scripture from Psalms that we read today. You have nothing to fear. I will be your refuge. I will get you through these famines. I will get you through this. But I don't want my partner to die. Even if your partner does die, I will be your refuge. And we will get through this together. But I don't want the divorce. Even if that is the case, God will walk with you. And we will get through this because he will provide. Father God, you see those who are standing right now. We thank you so much, Father, for being our provider. We're in a field in many ways not of our choice. Some of the circumstances of our lives have been unfair, famines and death that we did not plan on, we did not desire, we wouldn't wish not even on our worst enemy. But yet here we are. And so Father, we give ourselves to you again being reminded that you are the provider, you are the sustainer, and you will get us through to the other side. So like Ruth, we don't know what we did to find favor in your eyes, but keep looking at us with those eyes of favor. We are your daughter. We are your son. We'll go where you go. We draw near to you in Jesus' name.